Welcome back to Yesterday Like the Best. I'm your host, Michael Chang. It's my great pleasure to welcome my friend, Encore Jane, to the show. Encore, thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you for having, having me, Michael. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So for folks out there, Encore and I actually went to business school together, uh, went to Cornell, Johnson. We both graduated in 2000. We both took similar career paths out of business school. And what, 14 years later, we are back into short-term rentals. So we're really excited about this. We've been trying to get together for months now. Encore is the CF of a, one of the leading companies in short-term rentals. But why don't I, Encore, why don't I hand it over to you? Maybe if you can give yourself, give an introduction of yourself to the audience. Yeah, happy to. Yeah, as Michael mentioned, he and I met at business school. We did the same trip from upstate New York down to Manhattan every kind of Friday to meet with the investment <laughs> bankers. Got into investment banking, good old times. Yeah, and I we took like you know similar but slightly different route. I spent a number of years in banking, and then from there on, uh, took the first single family REIT in the nation public. So back in the day when invitation home, American homes so rent didn't exist, uh, we took the first one public and then opened up that space that. Uh, kind of like now there are multi-billion dollar REITs in the nation. Dabbled a little bit with another prop co, prop tech company called Mind Management, was a founding team member, spent four years there. It's still checking along and recently joined Avanste about a year, a little over a year ago as a CFO. Like it's interesting how we took different paths, but came together to the same space. I know it's, it's crazy. And I, I love how we've been able to before the show, talk about our respective journeys and, and, and up here. And, and so I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation on your view within Avanste as a CFO and, and seeing the broader landscape versus me as an individual entrepreneur, seeing stuff in my markets very deeply, but I don't, I lack that macro view that you have with the portfolio. Maybe just give like a 15, 20 second overview of Avanste for the audience. Yeah, so we Avanste is uh, again vacation rental management company, very similar to our other in the space like Vacasa, National Retreats, and whatnot. We manage properties for owners uh, who have investment properties. Typically, they tend to be larger. Our average property is four bedroom, three baths. We also have some estates, and we have some small single family homes, but for most part, it's that. Our portfolio is about 16, 1700 properties today, spread across 35 different markets. And we are growing rapidly through, through retail, through acquisition. We also have a couple of partnerships where there are, we have a Propco half a billion dollars where that Propco partner is buying assets. We help them buy assets, modify, uh, re remodel them and manage it for them. And then we also have a development partner uh, where we are like you know, buying land and developing it, uh, purpose-built communities for short-term rentals. From a from that perspective, it's very interesting to be managing it for retail owners who owns anywhere from one property to say five or six properties, and then all the way to, to the other side where you're working with institutions where they are like buying land and building purpose-built communities for STR. So uh, it has been it has been fascinating. It has been very interesting. And I was telling Michael, it feels like even after a year and a change in, I'm still learning and it's like I'm drinking from the fire hose, but super <laughs> exciting. Yeah, I know. I know. I remember we first took the job and, and we connected and, and it's been a year and it's, I'm sure you've learned a lot and there's still a lot more. I've been doing it for six years. I still learn every single day. This space continues to evolve and expand. I think it's really exciting. Can you talk to us about what you do at, so just to level set as a CFO of the business, what do you do and do, what do you do? What are you responsible for? Yeah. Yeah. And again, I want to say it's a startup, right? Like no matter, it might sound, it's a big company. It's at the end of the day. We proud ourselves or we pride ourselves in being very nimble and being able to, to navigate pretty or move pretty easily. So my official responsibility, I'm the CFO. So when I look, say CFO, there are three kind of key responsibilities. A, accounting for the business, making sure that the books are closed at the end of the month. How much did I collect in revenue? What was my spend? What's my net profit? The second one is like thinking more kind of long-term from a finance or finance has two sides of it. One is looking backwards and looking at the trends and what's going on. And then also thinking about where the business would be in six, nine, 12 or two years, five years time frame, right? Like just looking forward and trying to figure out where we can be both from a core portfolio, increasing the revenue, but then also growth. And then the, the thing that's unique to a CFO at a company like Avance Day is that we also have hundreds of owners who at the end of the month are expecting a paycheck, <laughs> uh, or not a paycheck, sorry, a distribution of like how much their property has made for them that given month. So 
reconciling the rent collected or revenue collected, reconciling what's the expenses we had that was on that property, and then giving them a statement along with a cash saying, this is how much you, the property made for you this kind of month. Mm-hmm. And again, for us, that's the, the crux of the business because at the end of the day, people are in it for making money and we're trying to <laughs> maximize it because if they do well, we'll do well as well because it's all, there's a strong alignment of interest there. Got it. So there's an internal finance function, making sure the books are balanced, that you're sending out the right P&Ls to your partners. Is there anything else that you're doing on the strategic side, on on strategy, on fundraising? Like you said, you guys are a startup. Anything you're doing on that end? I would say all of that because as part of this, we are a, we are a prop tech company. So yeah, we are a, a vacation rental management, but it's a tech, we're building our own technology underneath. We built our own PMS system. We have kind of connections with the, a lot of other distribution platforms. We have our own app, which are used by cleaners. We are like, are spending money from that perspective and I'm helping with the raise, both in terms of debt, raising debt and equity. So as to speak, and then also working with the part of the executive think tank and thinking about staffing, thinking about expansion, thinking about growth. Um, Yeah. So all that good stuff along with just the property management side of it. How has your investment banking experience and skill set and your MBA, how has it helped you in in learning this business and running this business or running part of this business? Yeah. What I would say, I think the... So you have to, there are the two sides of it, right? There's a micro and a macro. So you need to be in the details, but at the same time, you need to step back, think bigger picture, and then figure out where things would be in a few years of time. I think uh, from my perspective, investment banking gives you that uh, training where you can step back for a second, look at bigger picture. It also gives you enough technical skills to do trends analysis or debt modeling or thinking about things creatively. We do a lot of M&A deals, right? We have rolled probably north of 14 different property managers. So how are we funding it? How are we thinking about multiples there? What I would say that acts act as the backbone and then you're building on top of it because every industry you go into has its own nuances, has its own mm-hmm. things you need to learn about. Got it. Well, 14, 14 managers that you guys rolled up. So that is that's interesting. I think there's a lot of people that are thinking about the exit from short-term rentals, like they, after they built a, a company, how can they, in, instead of just the cash flow? And so that's something I'd actually love to get your view on as you're sitting on the other side of that equation there. But just to finish that point, where do you think investment banking has hurt you? Where do you think it has hurt us in this journey, this quasi-entrepreneurial journey? Or entrepreneurial in the fact that you started a business before Avant's Day. And for me, obviously, starting this business in 2016. Yeah. I, and again, I, as a banker, tough questions. You, tough questions. You, it's okay. a tough one, but look, I made that switch. I went from banker taking a, like the first read in the nation public or short-term rental or long-term rental read to being part of a fund who was trying to go public. And my biggest kind of, I wouldn't say frustration, but I came in and my biggest realization was Oh, things are not as clean as they are presented to a banker. Behind that nicely consolidated data, financial data, there's a ton of noise that the team sorted through before giving it to us. Mm. Right? So I always assume Sweet or Yardy or whatever ERP system that company is doing, and I'm going to punch in a query and I'll get a nicely formatted table saying this is the data. That's never the case. There's always <laughs> so many noise. There's so much noise, and I think for me. The first week was like, okay, I need to dive straight into the data. It's not, I'm not going to get it. I need to find it and I need to work with the team to smoothen it out. And there's always a story behind it. Things are not wrong. It's just like the data is looking funky because something happened. And I think as bankers, I I never had to deal with it because the CFO or the VP finance will give me a nicely formatted Excel sheet with all kind of the footnotes of what happened actually. Yeah. No, it is. And it's funny you mentioned that. It is it is a humongous change in thinking as you step off the ivory tower, to be fair, and then where everything's kind of nicely presented and then you do your thing. We're actually on the, at the operating level and getting all the data and trying to clean it up and make sense of it really gives you, a, I think, a different perspective of business. 
it's not about accretion dilution or, or things like that. It's contribution margin, right? Those revenue, like revenue recognition, profit, like all the cash, <laughs> all those things are like super, super important where when you're looking at kind of financial statements as an investment banker or as a financing provider, it's just a very different view. And I think that's really kind of helped me, at least for me, helped me inform how I've run my business. I've never taken a VC view of this business, to be fair. I've always taken a very private equity view of my business. And obviously we're doing different things. For me, it's just what's cash. I start there at the end of the month, like, what's the cash that I need? What's the cash do I want? Like how do I, and then I'll back solve for that right. versus people go from revenue to, to profit to cash. I go from cash to what profit do I need to make? And it's that conversion cycle to, to, to the revenue and to the margins. And that, that's where I actually, I, I want to take the next step of this conversation. So two things before, just to lay the framework out of the 15 plus hundred units that you guys run, what part of it is, maybe talk about that a little bit. What part of that is rental arbitrage where you are releasing the apartments and then re-renting it and earning the spread between the two? And what portion of it are managed uh, properties, which are obviously you're managing in exchange for a, a fee from the owner? Yeah. So our business, I want to say initially back in the day started as a rental arbitrage business. And then I think up until COVID, most of our portfolio was like it consisted of long-term leases, which we're turning around and doing short-term rentals on. But post-COVID, we made a conscious pivot to be more management or managed deals focused. And right now, three-fourths of our portfolio is managed units and about a fourth mm -hmm. of that is leased units. And I think what Got I would it. say is in the future, most of our current kind of deals that we are signing are, I would say 90 nine percent of those are managed management deals just because from a risk reward perspective they like the, the least least deals aren't penciling in yeah so let's double click on that and so my business we do rental arbitrage in philadelphia where we will rent properties long term and the last ones we sign are at three-year leases with three-year options and then we'll re-rent them and then we'll take those profits and we'll use it to buy properties and obviously it's very different we, it's so to folks listening it's very different when you're running your own business versus when you're running a business that has investors and a different, it's just a very different mindset on, on goals. If you're running a business with investors and it's VC backed, you cash flow that month is not, may not be your number one, may or may not be your number one priority. But when you're running your own business or what, for me, when I'm running my own business, we have to hit cash flow because we live off the business and that's it, it creates capital for us to make investments. So, it's just a different way of looking at the world. On the point about switching over to more managed, I've noticed that's a lot more of the bigger companies, like your competitors, like Sonder, Front Desk, Marsala, like all the bigger firms are switching to that model. Is that something where you're getting pushback from, we can speak high level on this. Is there, what, how are those conversations like with the owners? Because they go from a fairly guaranteed model to where they have to accept some variability in the revenue that they collect, like how, how do you, how do they, how do you talk to them about it where it makes sense for them to do this? Yeah. And again, you're talking about new owners or you're talking about existing ones where you, they already have a contract for, for leases. If it's, if they're different, let's hit on both if they're different. Yeah. So they are right. Like for one, as you said, you have a structure where you have three years, three year lease and a three year option. We have our structure is slightly different, but conceptually it's about the same. Uh, what we will, what we'll end up doing is right, and again, like all these, at least our leases have that rent increase over time. Um, Us too. So what we'll do is we'll look at the rent today, look at the rent in the market, and then try to come up with a return on that leases, and then look at okay, how much money are we going to make on the current rent or future rent based upon ADRs, occupancy that we are looking at, and then try to figure out if it makes sense to go from like a managed model or, or for a lease model. And the reality is we'll go back to the owner and say, hey, we had the lease model, would love to stake it, but the, the numbers aren't penciling in. This is what we try to shoot for. We can do, if you want us to take it on a, as a leased assets, that's the rent we can afford. If not, we'll be more than happy to do it on a management basis. And here's the contracts. And again, I'm not saying that's hundred percent of the time, but I would say conceptually we'll, we'll present both the options to the owner and let them mm -hmm. pick which one they want to do. Uh, but for us, what we, what we don't want to do is put a, put the company in a situation where 
we are losing money because we just didn't underwrite it properly. And Got again, it. and again, also back in the day, growing by leasing was the easiest way to grow because we didn't have a brand and people didn't trust us. So we wanted to take all the risk and show them that we can actually make money for them. For some of the owners, they've come back and say, you know what, we trust the brand. We love how you guys operate. And I, I'm more than happy to just give it to you as a management asset and take all the upside, right? Because from their perspective also is they're, they're going to be sharing in the profits. What are some of the common objections that, you, that they come back with? I'm sure it's not, it's a, it's an iterative conversation, right? Yeah. And you, yeah, I think more, more often than not, it's just, I don't want to take any risk, right? You take mm-hmm. my home, you take it for long term take care of the maintenance, take care of uh, what you want to do here. I just want a guaranteed rent. I'm going to pay mortgage, whatever the delta is, I'm going to make that. I think that's pr- most of the time is the biggest thing is just they don't want to deal with it. And again, if the numbers work, we'll be happy to do that. But if the numbers don't work, if I'm hypothetically making, say, 20% on a managed asset and I'm making, the based upon the current rent, I'm making 25% on the lease, while on lease I have all the downside. On managed, yeah. my downside is 25% of the revenue, or 20% of the revenue, then the... I don't know if it makes sense for me to go with, <laughs> and I think we just want to be very transparent with the owner of what makes sense for us on the lease side and what doesn't. And again, it's the same conversation on the managed side. What do we cover versus what they'll cover, all those different things. But I, I think the idea is for us to have a long-term relationship with them. We want to make sure that all the expectations are set yeah. upfront. We are very clear on who takes care of what no matter whether it's a leased asset or a managed asset, right? From splitting the revenue to splitting the kind of ancillary fees to splitting to the cost, like who provides men and how often, mm-hmm. all those different things. We just want to make sure that we are setting the expectations up front and are very clear on kind of that bifurcation. And then I think you brought the point about it, it, when you when I asked the question between existing inventory or existing contracts that you're moving over to the management model is so is it different when you're pitching new business is it a different is that conversation different versus and if so how with versus your existing existing relationships existing yeah. inventory yeah what, what i would say more our motion today is mostly is around management right we'll say our we'll lead with a management contract but if the owner comes back and say no i don't want to take this risk and I'm unsure about this management contract. I don't believe the underwriting you, you have on my home. Then we can go back to them with a with a leased contract as well, mm-hmm. especially if we feel strongly about our underwriting, which most of the times we do, and then give them both the options. But what I would say is the motion today is mostly on management contract. How do you think about how do you think about scale in this business? Very curious about your thoughts here. You obviously now have a brand. You have a, a large kind of portfolio that you can draw from. Do you think that come? Do, do you think? But you obviously have a lot more operational complexity. How do you kind of the benefits of scale? Like the the benefits of scale, like the brand and the, the infrastructure versus the, the operational complexity of operating in thirty five plus markets. Yeah, yeah, I think what I would say is anyone who wants to operate in more than say a handful of markets needs to have the right platform. And mm. for us, the last uh, six years or so of the company's existence, like the company was founded in 2016, has been about building technology. So be, building our own distribution platform, building the operating platform, connecting it with our accounting platform so that all things work seamlessly has been has been really important. And I would say every single company who wants to be successful or investor who wants to be successful across multiple markets need to have that backbone. And it doesn't need to be built ground up. You can take other platforms in the industry today and try to like combine them together, but there mm-hmm. needs to be a way for you to be able to manage. And then I think, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's just really interesting because when you talk about PMS systems, accounting systems, there's off the shelf software that is, is accessible to retail investors like myself. You guys obviously have chosen to, to build it in house. And I was an investor in a few companies, which I won't name pre COVID and they didn't come out the other side and it was unfortunate for me <laughs> as an investor. But so and that that's colored my thinking on the quote unquote tech part of it, and the tech part of short term rentals versus the underlying the underlying asset of the, the either the rental contracts, whether it be arbitrage, management contracts, 
or even own assets if you're buying and doing it. How do you think how do you think about like how do you think about value creation? And now we're going back to investment banking. What do you think how do you think about the value creation in this business? Is it is it in the management side? Because that's ultimately where equity value comes from, right? Like where are you creating real value? Do you think it's the combination of the proprietary tech you're building or is it more the tech is the tech and you need it, but it, it it's more of an, a, a tech enabled business where it enables the scale that you've been able to achieve across 35 markets and, and 1700 properties. How, how do you think about that? Yeah. So let me, so there are more than 24,000 property managers in the country today. And if you actually go back and look at them, they're mostly in that sub 500 properties per property manager. They tend to be in that 200 to 500 unit zip code, mostly all local, right? Or ancillary markets. You won't find that many. There, there are a few. I'm not saying there aren't any. And if you exclude the new crop or like you exclude the Picasso's of, of the world, Sonder, kind of natural retreats, even then, if you look at the traditional property managers who are using an existing system, there are, there are only a handful which have more than a couple of markets that they operate in. Yeah, okay. The reason that is, it's because as you start scaling, the, a lot of the platforms that are built today aren't built for multiple market scaling, right? For example, we pick up PMS that might do really well and can manage 500 units in a, in a given market. But now if you have on a second market, there, there are times when you have to just spin up a new PMS. And I'm not saying that's the, it's consistent across the industry. There are PMSs which, do, which can do more than that. But I'm saying historically, that has been the case, which does not allow people to, to scale up. What we have done and the reason we chose to build it is when we started building, there wasn't a, a viable option to, mm -hmm. to use. And the idea is that the only way you need to have one system which can then manage across the entire portfolio, right? So revenue management, it's not that we have individual general managers in a market kind of tweaking the revenue. We have one a team with a handful of people who can look at the curves and slopes and look at the data from multiple different sources and then automatically adjust the, the revenue on a given, um, on, on any given day automatically. And that's a muscle that we have built, which allows mm -hmm. us to maximize the revenue on a home. And again, you, if you have even 50 properties, maybe you can do it individually one by one weekly or even daily. But now if you go from 50 properties to 500 to 5,000, <laughs> how do you do it programmatically? So I think yeah. that's one of the big things that we are solving for is scaling this local industry. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, real estate is local. It's all yeah. about local relationship. It's all about if I'm an owner and I'm choosing a property manager, I don't want to give it to someone who is managing it all remotely. I want to go meet that. I want to have someone come to my house and have a conversation with me. And I'm talking about owners. I'm not talking about guests. Right? So, and then do you, do they know the right vendors? Can they use my handyman? Who would they use for cleaning? So it's a local business and we're trying to scale a local business and the way we do, we're doing it is using technology. Got it. And, and, I, I, I'm, and I'm just, I'm fundamentally curious and it, so just, and it's not pushing back, but I, I want to just dig in a little bit. If you're looking at, I'm just a quick math. If, we're do, if you say you have 2000 units and I know it's fewer than that, but just use round, sure. no, use round number 2000 divided by 35. That's 57, on average, 57 units per market that you're managing. And if the value proposition, if the go to sell, if the go to market motion is we are local yet global, yet, yet national, like how do you compete against like the V trips of the world where they are, they have hundreds of properties in a certain sub market in, in Florida or Tennessee in the south, Southwest markets. And I'm just using Vitros as an example because sure. their CEO is very social media savvy. So I see him all the time. Steve is a great, great social media person and operator. But like, how do you, how do you think about that when you're going against a scaled hyper local operator as you're going to market? That makes yeah. sense. And again, I think the way we are. I think about it. I don't want to like put everyone on the line. <laughs> on the, line. the way I think about that is you have, you would have different markets, right? And there's a life cycle. There'll be some markets where you have 15 units. There are other markets where we'll have, we'll be constant. We'll have the density and the concentration. The eventual goal is to have every single market at that density level, mm -hmm. but you won't have that on day one. So what's my break even point? How, when, at what point can I afford one local employee in that region and from there on it's as you're growing you're adding more people to it all the back office functions that are needed can be centralized and can be offshore too it's the, what and again this is not 
today, but back in the day when I was at Waypoint, which now is part of Invitation Homes, and the CEO of Waypoint is running Invitation, but I think a lot of the thought process has been similar, is property management at the end of the day is a series of talent. <laughs> and again, every company goes through their own. Like we came up with, back when we were building the platform for Mind, about nine tasks are that needs to be done for that mm -hmm. property. Short-term rentals is probably more, but like, you know, few thousand, <laughs> yeah, or the volume is a lot higher. Yeah. Look, at, and then how do you do it? Our goal was, what can we automate? Whatever that cannot be automated, can we offshore it? If we cannot oh, offshore smart. it, can we do it centralized? And whatever is left needs to be done at the local level. And I think even at Advanced Day, it's a similar philosophy of let's automate mundane tasks that does not, so that we can minimize the time spent on those and let make our local employees focus on the last mile kind of stuff with, hey, they, they're going in and checking the quality of housekeeping or they're looking at scoping out a vendor or meeting new owners. So what needs to be done on a local level, let's just make them only do that. And I think that allows us to have lower number of units to break even in a given mm -hmm. market. And then as you're adding density, it just that market will become more and more profitable. But I think going back to your original question is like the eventual goal is to have density in every single market. But uh, if you're in 35, you're not going to have density in right. every single market. The, so the initial goal is, hey, let's be cash flow break even in every single market. Yeah. And then from there on, we can keep on adding kind of density to make that market more profitable. So I think that is a, I think you illustrated elegantly a very important point. And that is like that density in the market is that's where you're going to get the scale advantages where I see a lot of people run into problems and then they don't have their small entrepreneurs or small teams is that they try to go to too many markets at the same time. And that operational complexity eventually just buries them because they don't have they can't build, they can't purpose build technology like you do. And they just run out of bandwidth and steam and capital. And I think where you're differentiated or it's, you can build the technology yourself in house off the shelf software. There's only so much customization you can do, but if you can actually customize your own software for the same workflows that you're encountering in your specific situations, you can, you really can automate a lot of those little things that you can't do if you're someone like me that is using like Hostaway or Price Labs, right? We have to use their platform and kind of work around it. Whereas you guys, if you have it internally, you can just do your own thing and very customize and optimize for your market there. And I think that if you can do that and take away a lot of the day-to-day -day mundane tasks that otherwise you would need a person to do or an offshore to do, then that there's a lot of margin there, not just on the cost side, but also better guest reviews, better, just a better listing that, that will make more money, that, that return on capital will be a lot higher. And the, the second part of it is from a technology side, I think, and, and this is what I'd love to get your view on is, do you think you guys can operate by just taking, there's a handful of PMS operators, would you be able to just take one of theirs and, and modify it for yourself? Or does it really have to be ground up? Do you think that's like a huge competitive advantage for you guys that tech, that that customized PMS system or revenue management platform that you build in house or task management platform. Yeah, that's a that's something we we are at least I have dealt with at multiple startups now, right? Like mm -hmm. we asked the same question back at mine. We were like founding team member, eight guys in a room trying to think through whether we should build or whether we should buy. Mm -hmm. And it's an important question. I think at the end of the day, we decided to build. Because when you're an early stage startup, people would not give you that much traction, right? Like a company like Yardi or MRI would not change their roadmap for us. They want to sell to a broader market. So they would not build the customization that I needed for to run my business the way I want to run it. As you said, it's more about this is what I'm offering. How can I best use it and best make it like work for my individual need? Mm -hmm. I, I, I personally think that the benefit only comes in if you're at a certain scale. If mm -hmm. I have 50 properties, even 100 properties, maybe even 200, you don't need like a custom solution. But if you're in 35 different markets with thousands of property, then you might want to start thinking about either kind of uh, building your own or at least taking something which is you can customize and then spending the resources and customizing it. So like mm -hmm. maybe the solution is not 100% custom. Maybe the, the, the right answer for individual situation is to take something that exists and then build on top of it. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. That, that's a, yeah, I, I think I probably would argue that it's probably less units. Unit count definitely has a fix, but like just the number of markets that you're in, I think the market count really increases complexity. If you have 500 units, but they're in two buildings in a downtown, a CBD that like you can, or you a thousand units that really you can use the same, you probably can use an off the shelf software to do it. It wouldn't probably wouldn't really need customization, but if you're across a broader swath, it's going to be, it's going to be a huge issue. I, I want to, I do want to close off this question loop though. Where do you think the value creation is in the business? Do you think it's on the technology side or do you think it's on the real, the real estate slash management side, the hard assets or, or the tech? I, I think it's both, right? Like uh, the, you need the scale and you need to be one of the, one of the very few property managers or vacation rental managers today, which are in, is operating in that many different markets profitably. Right. And the whole idea is, and then we are using technology to supplement it. I don't think we can hit the, the same EBITDA margins or uh, kind of uh, gross margins if we want, if we didn't have the right technology platform to back us up. So I think the value creation is in bringing those two things together where you now have a scalable platform which can m manage across markets at scale. And I think that's what the VCs are excited about is it's a combination of hard assets and, tech, and the right technology, which is coming together to make it into a profitable company. Okay. I'm going to put you in the spot. We're back. We have our banking hat on. So we, are we applying a revenue multiple here or are we applying EBITDA multiple here? I think that, so. So what I would say today, given the growth of the company, we're doing revenue multiple. If you're growing 50, 100, 200, 300%, your EBITDA multiple is not going to get you there. Plus also as a early stage company who is like putting a ton of money in growing the, uh, the technology, what's the right EBITDA, right? That's not a sustainable EBITDA. So EBITDA multiples makes the total sense when the company stabilizes, And I do think at some point this industry will trade on EBITDA or this company, but I think today it should be mostly either revenue multiple or contribution profit multiple. I agree. I absolutely agree. The contribution multiple, definitely. I think fundamentally in the end, although if it's more management, I think there's a different I think I have a slightly different lens, but if it's an arbitrage portfolio, I really think it's like, it, it has to be a cash flow multiple. Even with, with manage, you'll get to the same point, right? There's a take rate and then there is a, a net kind of profit on that take rate. Um, mm -hmm. So you, the, you'll be surprised, at least on our portfolio, how close that contributions are, which is also one of the okay. very interesting things that we learned over time is, and again, some of our deals are super profitable because we struck them at the at the right time in the right market. Sure, at some point they will like you know, cycle through and we'll have to pay them higher rent. But you're enjoying it right now because yeah. you, you've got the right deal at the right time. Uh, but I think over time they'll, they'll converge, right? The consumers are getting smarter. The landlords are getting smarter. They are asking for more rent, which is like you know, reducing the the arbitrage opportunity. So I think it'll be, it'll be, you, and I'm sure you, people like you, specialists like you will find a new market where that exists and then have a profitable business there for a few years. And then at some point it'll, it'll roll. But I think that's at least what I'm seeing is that over time in, in tier one markets, that arbitrage opportunity has started to diminish because people, if they are giving it to a short term rental company, want higher rent. And I, I know that- I would say, I would say yes in certain types of, if you're in downtown CBD or if you're a class A building, I do think there's actually, and there still remains to be material opportunity in A minus B plus, B other kind of sub A markets that you're 95% occupied with the beautiful pool and beautiful view. There's no spread there. But if you're a little bit outside, you can, if you're a little bit outside of that CBD and it's a good location with the right amenities, I do think there is still opportunity there for arbitrage just because they're not, and I probably shouldn't say this because my landlords might hear this, but there's still a knowledge gap between what we do here and, and, it, and it will close because the data tools are just getting a lot better. But I do think there's still material opportunity out there and it's, we've seen, but for us, like we're just very... Like we have the, we have our, we have everything set up in one market. We know we can do X number and then we can find a rent that supports that we'll take there. hundred percent. It's also supply and demand, right? There's a lot more demand for that arbitrage and people are pushing up. Yeah. Rent, uh, it closes, uh, but yeah, there are markets today where you can do that. And, and there's the brands too, right? You come in, you come in with, I, I want to close off on, or I want to just, I want to transition to conversation, but I have one more question. Why are certain co public companies gross margin negative? In the similar why, why, like how, why are why are people not making money on a on, on a gross margin, not even a contribution margin basis? And for if you can just like a ten second explanation, what is the difference between you'll ex explain a lot more eloquently than me? 
gross margin versus contribution margin? And why do you think certain companies aren't even gross margin positive? Are you talking about like some of the couple of public companies that we have in space? Look, every company is different, right? The reason, and I'll give it to you, there are companies out there who build, whose entire portfolio and majority of the portfolio is lease arbitrage. And again, they're competing against hotels, right? With uh, apartments and single units here and there. It's, I think for those, it's priced to the bottom, like who can keep on reducing the cost and they are not making the, the written revenue that they thought they would, which then essentially means that they are, their leases are upside down or not all of them, but a lot of them, which is like then creating issues for them. The other side of it is the asset, like what's their portfolio consist of? Like uh, to give you an example, if you're a hotel chain, are you the Marriott, Hyatt, or the Ritz Carlton of the world, or are you, are you Best Western? Nothing wrong with either or, it's just what kind of portfolio have you built? And there is only so much revenue you can attract for a Best Western versus yep. what you can attract for a Marriott, right? As I said, as I mentioned before, our portfolio by design was larger properties. We just thought that we, the A, there's the supply is limited and more importantly, it's a, it's a bigger property. We can do more with it. We can provide ancillary services. We can do chefs. We can do kind of grocery, all that different things, which people want if they're traveling together in a group, right? So our yeah. company is geared towards group travel. There are other companies which are geared towards, you know, a family traveling and they have a different revenue profile, different expense profile. And I think that's where the difference arises of what the portfolio comprised of and how well are you running the property? I think that yeah. the operation is the big one, right? How Huge. much are you spending in, in housekeeping? <laughs> how much are you spending in repairs and maintenance? How much are you spending in recurring services? What kind of negotiations you're doing on it? So I think at the end of the day, it's you ask about contribution, at least the way I look at that is oh, what's my revenue? What's all, my all direct cost? what's my kind of the profit profit so as to speak at the end of the day and the easiest way to understand contribution at least from my lens is if i were to add one more property in that region what's the incremental dollar i'm going to make on it so that's the easiest way to think of it but i think it's the composition of the portfolio which is then dictating whether they're going to be profitable on a contribution margin basis or not and then the operations great answer i wish we had more time i feel like we could talk a lot more about we, we had four topics to cover then we hit one in the 40 minutes that we spent together i know you have to hop i really appreciate you coming on the show and i definitely want to have you on again you bring a really really distinct perspective that very few people can hear publicly on how these large come from your background and the seat that you have right now. How do you view the world? How do you view growth? How do you view these portfolios? How do you view margins? I want to really thank you for, for sharing your perspective and I'd love to have you back on. My last question, which I ask everyone is this is a team sport and we wouldn't be where we are without help from others. What's one of the kindest things that people, someone has helped you along the way to get you to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what I would say the more than kindest thing, what I would say is uh, one of my a senior leader at the company I joined just after banking said, told me, right? which then shaped my leadership style, shaped like how I view things. So we, banking is as nonstop, right? You're working 120, 130 hours. You were just like high paid personality day in, day out there. And you could be, for lack of a better word, an asshole at times, right? And the guy told me when I came in and I was like, the same mentality, yes, go get it, go, go. And I said, look, it's, a, it's a, not a sprint, it's a marathon. What I want you to know is uh, we want to get the same amount of work done as you were doing in the business or investment banking days, but you don't need to be an asshole and we don't need to sacrifice your family life. You need to make sure that you balance both of them because I want you here for next 10 years and not next 10 months. So don't burn yourself out. And I think that... It's a very simple thing you said, but I think that changed my perspective because then I started to weigh both the things. I had a five month old at home and I barely saw him. And then that changed to, okay, I'm going to come back home. I'm going to see him for a couple of hours. And then I'm going to log back in again at night because I still want to get the work done. It's just like you know, that flexibility. And then from there on, I've been here, that's, that's a decade, over a decade ago. I do the exact same thing with my entire team. I want the stuff done, but I would let you manage your time. Family is important. Something, someone is sick, something's not working, go take care of them because it's a, I want you to be a part of my team for the next 10 years, not the next year where I burn you out and then 
you move on and someone else comes back in. It's funny that you make the point about family and the marathon that you and I have both been on since business school, 14 years now, we're in the same place. But yeah, like for, it was very much, I didn't have kids at the time, but I knew that when I had a five month old, I didn't want to, I want to be able to spend the time with her. And I'm, I just feel very blessed to, to find this business and to be able to build a business and have this kind of flexibility. And I'm really glad to hear that both of us have moved on from that type A personality for investment banking. I do think it's a, and the world has changed since 2000, 2009 too. Sure. This is a much more sustainable way of, of living life and then building a business and making money, but also having a real life and not just being stuck on phone calls and presentations for the rest of our lives. Hey, thanks again for joining. I know you got to hop and I look forward to hopefully having you on again. Thank you again. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. 